while the title of my talk is The Culture of Liberty, culture covers a lot of things. I mean, obviously, it covers things like whether or not you like Brene sauce, tacos, or steaks. Those are not the type of things I'm talking about here. What I'm referring to are the values, the fundamental values that a society needs to have both economic prosperity and social freedom. Uh, we as libertarians believe in both social freedom and economic freedom. And there are sets of values that are consistent with them and sets of values that are not. I want to start first with market values. Now, markets don't solve problems. Markets can't solve problems because markets are not conscious beings. They don't understand problems, they don't consider solutions, they have no brains, they have no desires, and in one very real sense, markets do not even exist. A lot of libertarians are very fond of saying that society doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't in the same sense that markets don't exist. Both markets and societies are institutional arrangements that exist to help the true problem solvers do the jobs they have before them. Those problem solvers are people. Some of the problems they solve are small, some of them are large. An institutional arrangement makes, uh, as an institutional arrangement, markets provides some very important components for problem solving. First, markets offer incentives to problem solvers. Second, depoliticized markets offer problem solvers the freedom to pursue solutions. Third, market institutions convey knowledge to the problem solvers. It tells them where the problems exist or where the opportunities exist. It tells them what resources are available. It tells them what problems people want solved most urgently. It tells them whether they are succeeding or failing. It gives them information as to whether or not the cost of the solution is greater than the cost of the problem. A solution that imposes costs that are greater than the problem is not a solution. Markets also encourage cooperation in ways that are not otherwise possible. Markets limit the harm of failed solutions while maximizing the benefits of successful ones. They reward problem solvers when they get it right. Now, none of this implies that markets are perfect. They're not. I do not believe there's any such thing as perfect competition. There never has been, never will be. Markets don't reach equilibrium either. Production doesn't exactly match demand. What happens in, an inst in this institutional arrangement that we call a market is a process. It is not an end state. This means that there's a constant shifting of resources, always responding to the constant changes in demands and requirements. Resource availability is always changing. New problems arise that need new solution. Old solutions no longer work. What we call the market is constantly in flux, constantly evolving. There is a tendency toward equilibrium, but it never reaches that stage. It merely points us in the directions that make the most sense at any one point in time. What makes markets better is that it has the institutional arrangement that encourages solutions. It can't promise us solutions. Those are up to our fellow human beings to create. It just gives us the incentives to try to get it right. Once we understand that what we call market is a complex social order of human action, then we have to look at the role that culture plays, not just in the market as a producer, but in the pursuit of a free society. The libertarian ought to have as his goal the pursuit of not only economic prosperity, but human flourishing, 
where the rights of each individual is respected. Now, not all human values are conducive to those goals. Just because libertarians believe in freedom of beliefs does not mean that we are cultural relativists. Not all cultural values are equal. Some undermine markets and social freedom. Some undermine one, but not the other. And some values encourage both. Importantly, values are not immutable. They can change. The reality is that, society, that the society that a lot of us libertarians imagine is one that will not and cannot exist without a cultural revolution first. I don't think that there are social structures consistent with classical liberalism that do not require seismic changes in our cultural values. I do think, however, that the vision of the most radical libertarians does require this sort of shift, and it is one reason I am skeptical of that program. Harvard sociologist Edward Bainfield, in his celebrated book, The Unheavenly City, noted that within any culture there are subcultures, and those subcultures have values which are different and that these values lead to very specific characteristics about the group. He wrote, these secondary characteristics are probably caused directly or indirectly by the primary one. In any case, each subculture displays distinctive attitudes towards example, for example, authority, self-improvement, risk and violence, and distinctive forms of social organizations, most notably a family organization. Bainfield referred to these subgroups as classes. He did not mean them in the sense that Marx means classes. He did not mean them in the sense of race or anything like that, just simply a set of values. As might be expected, he said that those who are at the lower end of this class scale are primarily individuals who seem most affected by social problems in society. He described their worldview and their value system. He said that at the present oriented end of the scale, the lower class individual lives from moment to moment. If he has any awareness of a future, it is of something fixed, fated, beyond his control. Things happen to him. He does not make things happen. Impulse governs his behavior, either because he cannot discipline himself to sacrifice a present for a future satisfaction or because he has no sense of the future. He is therefore radically improvident. Whatever he cannot consume immediately, he considers valueless. His bodily needs, especially for sex, and his taste for action take precedence over anything else and certainly over any work. He works only as he must to stay alive and drifts from one unskilled job to another, taking no interest in the work. Bainfield said that such individuals have difficulties maintaining stable relationships, that they're often hostile and suspicious of others. Now, of course, these types of values affect the outcome. What your view of, of work is going to affect how prosperous you are. Even in a completely free society, if you don't work, you're not going to prosper. A free market cannot guarantee that you will have the results you want. You have to take the actions necessary in order to do that. Now, Hernando de Soto pointed out there's a lot more to it than just uh, market incentives. We also have things like legal structures and property rights, which can have a massive effect on prosperity. Uh, many of the third world countries, the biggest problem for people there who are entrepreneurial but poverty stricken is that they don't own technically in any legal sense what they have. 
They're not allowed to own it. They have no title to it. It makes it very difficult for the markets to effectively and efficiently work without a legal structure that backs up those markets. But I think it's still very difficult for us to es escape the conclusion that the values that individuals hold and not the balance of their bank accounts is a prime cause for the problems that people experience. Now, within any community, people need to cooperate and work together for uh, one another to better themselves. This is one of the basic functions of the market. But in a community consumed by the values described by Bainfield, it becomes very difficult to establish relationships. Francis Fukuyama points out, social capital can be defined as an insatiated set of informal values of norms shared among members of a group that permits them to cooperate with one another. If you don't have the right values that allow you to cooperate, you don't cooperate. If you do not cooperate, you do not prosper as well as those who do cooperate. Markets allow people to act. How people act is determined by the values that they hold. Free markets don't produce wealth. It only allows for the production of wealth. People still are going to have to do the producing. And some values impede wealth production and act to destroy individual freedom. Now we can look back at some of economic history and we can see how, for instance, religious values have affected uh, prosperity. <laughs> Consider the Christian dogma that was prominent in Europe for centuries that loaning money at interest was considered sinful and wicked. The Christian nations saw that as a very distasteful thing to do, even if they sometimes accepted that it was necessary, it was still sinful. So good Christians were discouraged from lending money. But economics has taught us that money lending is an honorable and useful profession. So the Christians left this practice not, uh, to non-Christians, primarily to Jews. The Jews prospered and the Christians benefited from the loans, but the process encouraged anti-Semitism and wild conspiracy theories. Similarly, the issue of economic arbitrage was considered by many as suspect. Buying something at a low value in one place, importing it and selling it somewhere else at a high value was considered somewhat disrespectful. The middleman in the market was considered suspicious. The, the vendor who would take the products from the farmer and then go and sell them was considered with a bit of disdain in a way that the vendor was not. So the role of the middleman in these cultures was often left, again, to people who were political outsiders, who were considered not as good as everyone else. Again, in Europe, this meant that they often reserved the middleman to uh, people who were Jewish, which, of course, many of those vendors grew up to be merchants, created stores, uh, which, of course, again, as I said, every time this has happened, it's created resentment, conspiracy theories, anti-Semitism, and so forth. In Asia, this role was often played by ethnic Chinese who were living in non-Chinese countries. And as well, in those countries, you often had uh, attacks on the Chinese community, disdain for them, contempt for them, because they prospered, because they did the jobs that the, other, the, the culture said wasn't a good thing to do. Now, we can make a long list of the values that actually do encourage markets to work. Some are like frugality, punctuality, the importance of keeping your word, the ability to trust others, um, in some cultures, it was cons it's considered rude to compete. Competition is a rude thing to do. 
It's unfair to, to, to open a store in competition with someone else. It, it's, it's all right if you do it somewhere else where there's a need, but you shouldn't do it where there's actually direct competition. In other cultures, there's a widespread belief that there are supernatural forces which make everyone a victim of those forces. You have no control over your life. Either if you're blessed, it's because the gods have blessed you. If you're cursed, it's because the gods have cursed you or demons have cursed you or evil spirits have. You have no control over your destiny. Obviously, the value you hold about whether or not your actions can prosper yourself will largely affect how well you do in life. People who believe that they are complete victims of circumstance, that they can't do anything to prosper, aren't going to do anything to prosper because they have no reason to. If you distrust other people, it makes it very difficult, it, it raises the transaction costs for doing business. Now, we could, for instance, substitute trust with written contracts. Written contracts are costly, they're time consuming. Every time there's a written contract, you're increasing the cost of doing business and making it less likely that you're going to prosper as a result of it. And it's still true that government can cut all of the impediments that are put in the way of the market. Take away all the regulations and I argue that there will still be values which people can hold, which will impede markets almost as efficiently as government regulations will, especially when those values are very widely held. A free market may allow freedom for belief, but not all beliefs encourage free markets. And some beliefs are actually very deadly to free markets. Now, if I were a conservative, I would stop here. I've discussed economic freedom, and that is pretty much where the conservative wishes freedom to end. I, however, oppose socialism of the soul as much as I oppose socialism of the wallet. Ayn Rand said that there is no mind-body dichotomy, that there's no split between the practical and the moral. Certainly, the studies that have been done of various cultures shows that nations that tend to have more social freedom uh, also tend to be more economically free. That economic freedom and social freedom go together very well. Now, I know that some people use the term freedom in a very absolutist sense, in which case, there is nothing in the real world that satisfies their definition of freedom. But I'm using it more in a relative sense. And that in spite of the atrocities of our government, we are still relatively free. And the world, for the most part, is freer today than it has been at most times in the past. Now, if your only concern is that of white middle class straight men, you might think otherwise. I tend to look at our species as a whole and not one group that was generally better treated in legal terms than everyone else. Economically freer nations also hold values about social issues. Studies show that these, the cultures that are more rational versus more religious tend to be more prosperous. Religion econ uh, impacts economic and social freedom in many ways. For instance, religions that emphasize hierarchy, such as Catholicism, tended to encourage political authoritarianism. Protestantism was more dispersed with little emphasis on hierarchy. And the political structures in those nations tended to be more diffused and competitive. There was a greater emphasis on individual freedom, even though both strands of Protestantism, Calvinism and Lutheranism, were very intolerant of heresy. The fractured nature of these areas, with multiple small city-states encouraged competition between the governments, and there was free movement of labor. 
it pushed those areas towards more economic and political freedom. The only way they could attract labor was by being freer than their neighbors. This is one of the reasons that libertarians, I think, should support free immigration. It's the move, movement of labor across borders that is the gauge that tells us which places are freer than others and better off than other places. And it's one of the reasons I would argue that politicians oppose free movement of labor. They do not want that barometer out there measuring how well they're doing and how badly they're doing. In his book, Capitalism and the Permissive Society, Samuel Britton wrote that capitalist civilization is above all rationalist. It is anti-heroic and anti-mystical. He points out that the capitalist, as a profit maximizer, is forced to ignore the, quote, traditional, mystical, and ceremonial justifications of existing practice. The capitalist who doesn't do that will lose out to the capitalist who does. Thus, Britain concludes, the breakdown of theological authority the rise of scientific spirit and the growth of capitalism were interrelated phenomena. Freedom like science requires questioning. Question authority doesn't just mean question political authority. In a free society, all authority is questioned. You question dogma and scientific theories Faith, however, says that you shouldn't question. You should believe. A faith-driven culture is one where questioning is, at best, more difficult. In place of questioning, what is encouraged is obedience. Another value that is found in freer nations is tolerance. This is tolerance for people who aren't like you. Everyone is tolerant of people who mirror themselves. It's much harder to be tolerant of somebody very much unlike yourself. Racial bigotry or anti-gay prejudices are examples of intolerance. Now, can an individual bigot be a libertarian? Technically, of course. If they don't infringe the rights of others, what they are doing is still consistent with libertarianism. But I would argue that while an individual can be bigoted and libertarian at the same time, a culture cannot be bigoted and libertarian at the same time. That, I think, is impossible. Individuals live inside cultural bubbles. These cultural bubbles surround us, and they inhibit how we behave. They give us permission or take away permission socially, not through coercive action, but through frowns, displeasure, family, people, you know, shame on you. The way you behave is largely determined by the culture that surrounds you. Remove cultural inhibitions and people act differently. And I would argue that when certain levels of intolerance are achieved within a culture, that the restraints that prevent those who are intolerant from acting on their intolerance are removed, and that people begin acting in a, not just a discriminatory or intolerant manner, but in an aggressive rights-violating manner. If we go back to Germany of the 1900, early 1900s, it was really unthinkable that people would attack Jewish shops or put people in concentration camps. Germany was one of the most liberal countries in Europe in, the, in terms of uh, the way it saw rights for individuals and the acceptance of Jews as individuals. But there had been growing within Germany a culture of anti-Semitism inspired largely in the beginning by Marx. Marx, of course, attributed capitalism to, he said capitalism was the Jewish spirit, it was Jewish materialism. And the Marxists pushed a lot of anti-Semitism, which the Nazis built up on. Now, when you start to add all the other historical factors that took place, 
and the rise of Hitler and the National Socialists, what changed was the cultural inhibitions that people had. The culture shifted and it gave all those people who were bigoted permission to now act on those beliefs. A lot of people say, why, you know, why Christianity and Islam are fundamentally different and the proof is, look how the Islamics are terrorists and you don't see that from Christians. Well, not today, but you can go back in history and you find it. What changed was the culture in which the people, these individuals live. I can assure you there are f hardcore fundamentalist Christians who would be as violent as radical Muslims if they lived in a culture that gave them permission to act that way. They don't live in that culture, so they don't act that way. Go to Saudi Arabia, go to Afghanistan, and you now have people with the same types of intolerance with a different religion living in a culture that does give them permission. This is why I'm saying, we as individuals, individuals can be bigoted and you can still have a free society, but if the culture is bigoted, I do not believe you can have a free society. I believe that hatred particularly is imperialistic. Hatred takes more territory whenever it can. Uh, we, we forget often the history of lynching in this country, which was so common, particularly in the South. We forget that Puritans murdered people for being Quakers in this country. The culture in which they lived at that time had given them permission to do that. Ours was a nation where the culture said it was all right to own another human being as a piece of property. Where did the freedom for slavery come, the freedom to, that destroyed slavery come from? It came from a cultural shift in how people perceived African Americans, how people perceived the institution of slavery, how people perceived the, the entire relationship, uh, often in theological terms. I mean, you go through the justifications for slavery in the American South, and you will find it was heavily rooted in a fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible. Because the Bible says slavery is all right. Now, I lived for a time in Africa where people believe in witchcraft, that there are literally witches. And people said, well, didn't you know, that improve with the Christian missionaries? It didn't, it got worse. <clears throat> because now the white man had come in and said, God's book says there are witches. And in fact, over here in Leviticus, we see thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. God gives you permission to kill witches. And one of the things that I remember that so drove home the point of culture was a soccer match soccer match. Two soccer teams playing what they call football, we call soccer. It, no, a kitten ran out on the field. And the players all chased it down and stomped it to death because they were convinced that that kitten had to represent a witch who was sent onto the field to curse one of the teams, and they weren't sure which one of the teams was being cursed. Excuse me, where did you say you were living then? That was South Africa. Thank you. South Africa. In South Africa, approximately 300 people per year burned to death as witches. Now? Today? Today. This continues today. They have created entire villages for people who have been accused of witches to give them places of refuge where they can try to at least live and escape from these types of actions. These cultural values do lead to action. Beliefs lead to actions. What you think changes how you act. 
And that's why I'm saying that not all values are consistent with libertarianism. Another value that, success, that they find in uh, unsuccessful nations is a belief in a reliance on traditional value. Things that have been done one way are always done that way. Change is considered bad. Hayek contrasted this with what he called the classical liberal view. He said that liberals or libertarians are not averse to evolution and change. And he said that when spontaneous change has been smothered by government control, it, liberalism, wants a great deal of change. This, he argued, was in conflict with a conservative attitude, which was a fear of change, a timid distrust of the new as such. Hayek said his position is based on courage and confidence, on a preparedness to let change run its course, even if we cannot predict where it will lead. He warned that those who cling to traditional values, quote, are inclined to use the powers of government to prevent change and to limit its rights to whatever appeals to the more timid mind. Another difference between Hayek and the conservatives was that he saw order as emerging from voluntary interactions between people. The conservative, however, saw order as the result of the continuous attention of authority. The conservative, he said, feels safe and content only if he is assured that some higher wisdom watches and supervises change, only if he knows that some authority is charged with keeping the change orderly. Hayek believed in the rule of law with government power strictly limited by the general rules needed for the social order. Contrast this, he said, with the conservative who does not object to coercion or arbitrary power so long as it is used for what he regards as right purposes. He believes that if government is in the hands of decent men, it ought not be too much restricted by rigid rules. Hayek warned that the conservative is less concerned with the problems of how the powers of government should be limited than with, what, with that of who wields those powers. And he said that he regards himself as entitled to force the value he holds on other people. Hayek said that conservatives lacked principles but not moral convictions. He said, in fact, that the conservative was often a man of very strong moral convictions, but he has no political principles which enable him to work with people whose moral values differ from his own. Hayek's liberal social order allows people of differing convictions to pursue freedom of their own values. The joking response to conservatives, if you don't like it, gay marriage, don't get gay married, actually encompasses Hayek's view of a, a liberal society. Those who oppose erotica are free not to buy erotica. Those who oppose abortion are free to not have abortions. Those who oppose gay marriage are free to not get gay married. It is here that Hayek's liberalism is clearly in opposition to both conservative and, conservatism and socialism. He said, I sometimes feel that the most conspicuous aspect of liberalism, by which he means progressivism, is, oh no, I, this is where he's actually referring to modern uh, classical liberalism here, sorry, is it is as much uh, from socialism, uh, from conservatism as from socialism in its view that moral beliefs concerning matters of conduct which do not directly interfere with the protected sphere of other persons do not justify coercion. The Hayekian liberal, he said, faces reality without claiming the authority of supernatural forces when reason fails him. He says that the true liberal, or in our case libertarian, 
lets others seek their happiness in their own fashion and adheres consistently to that tolerance which is the essential characteristic of liberalism. So in the end, when we choose what outcomes we want, that we want a free society, we cannot hold values which are inconsistent with the free society. More importantly, I think, that we need to use social sanction, the power of, of uh, just being opposed to those values when you run into them, even if those values are espoused by somebody who claims to be a libertarian. I think it's a, that racism is one of the most abhorrent things in the world. I mean, it is a form of collectivism uh, which is irrational. It is, I mean, there's almost everything you can think of is wrong with it is wrong with it. And yet there are libertarians who say some of the most racist and bigoted things, outrightly, openly racist. And a lot of libertarians say, well, they're not advocating force against others, so we should tolerate it. Well, now, if that type of libertarian, if we had a libertarian society where that type of libertarian, that value became the dominant culture, is, do you really think it would stop there? Do you really think that, these, that people who are driven by such contempt and hatred for others would stop their actions at the border that libertarianism draws when the culture around them says it's okay to go farther if you want? I don't think it will. And I think it's important for libertarians to make clear that while we believe in their rights to say things that are horrible and awful, that we also, as individuals, condemn the things that they are saying, and that we are drawing a line between us and them, and saying that their beliefs in, a, in any culture were the, to become dominant would be antithetical to everything that libertarians believe in. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, tomatoes? It, it created some problems and not other problems in some ways. Uh, I mean, Christianity is not one thing. Christianity is many things, particularly in Europe. I think at different times its influence had different uh, impact. I certainly do believe that when Christianity fractured and broke up and the church monopoly sort of ended, one result of that was a reluctant tolerance, religious tolerance. It may have taken them a few years to have gotten tired of murdering each other, uh, but if you look into, for instance, the history of this country and why we have a First Amendment that says separation of church and state, you had colonies that were all controlled by different religions. All of them were awful. I mean, you got Virginia, for instance, banned Catholic priests. Now, the exceptions were the Quakers in Pennsylvania and uh, Roger Williams in Rhode Island. But basically their view was that all the other religions should be banned. When the country was founded, you had the Quakers in Pennsylvania worried that the Puritans in Massachusetts could impose their view on the nation. The Anglicans in Virginia were worried about the Catholics in Maryland. So because none of the groups felt that they could dominate the entire country, they accepted religious freedom, not because they believed in religious freedom, but because they were afraid that they weren't, wouldn't be the ones who would wield the whip uh, when, the, when a state church was imposed. So it, to the sense that there was a lot of breakup, uh, in Europe from the different religions, that helped. Um, in some ways, Catholicism then, though, was still better than the Protestantism of Luther and Calvin. 
the Catholicism of that age, though very authoritarianism, uh, authoritarian, did bring back the concept of Aristotelian reason. And that was very high within scholastic circles of Catholicism. And Luther and Calvin despised that. They wanted to return to the irrationalism of Augustine. So they wanted to take the church backwards in that sense. So, you know, it, it, the splintering in the end is what did it. And it was the splintering of Europe which meant that capitalism, I think, arose in Europe. The splintering of, the political splintering in Europe led to the rise of capitalism in Europe. Because you now had literally hundreds of city-states, small communities, and remember that labor could move, in that sense, to move to a different country meant moving across the river to the city on the other side. So once you had free movement of labor, once you had the splintering of political authority, it, the, the rulers were forced to become more and more liberal and more and more tolerant of the, the workers, the merchant classes, and what you started to see was the rise of a capitalist spirit. That's why I think you saw capitalism in Europe, but you never saw it in China. And I know some people say that capitalism was, you know, the, 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 the conservatives in particular like to say capitalism is the result of Christianity. Well, the odd thing is take a look at where the Christian world was. And yes, you see it in Western Europe, but Eastern Europe was equally as Christian. But the difference was Eastern Europe was, had much more monolithic political control, where there wasn't that type of competition that allowed the rise of capitalism. <coughs> so I don't think it was, Christianity was sufficient for it. Yes, yes, yes. The, 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 well, Rome brought, down its, brought about its demise in numerous ways, including the rise of Christianity and the rise of the empire. Um, one of the things, by the way, it's an interesting period, in, and I'm trying, there's a book, 382 AD, by Charles Freeman, which is actually quite interesting. And he also did... Um, several histories on early Christianity and histories on how reason in the West was destroyed. Because of course there was a very dominant belief in reason amongst the Greeks. It wouldn't be perfect, there were all sorts of problems with it, but it was a strong sense of, of belief in reason and it disappeared from the West mm -hmm. and we ended up in the Dark Ages. And he talks about how that happened. Now I find it the period of, of Rome at that time, very fascinating because you watch the intolerance rise. You watch the, the smaller Christian uh, minority taking over the empire and getting political control. And amongst the things they started doing was burning down synagogues, uh, making paganism illegal, shutting down the competitive temples from other religions. Um, and once they had done that to all the other religions, then of course the, the different sects within Christianity at the time started murdering off each other and using political power. So you ended up literally with, with the Roman emperor pretty much deciding which Christianity was going to be orthodox and which was going to be heresy. And a lot of people... I like to remind conservatives because they, it, it flies in their face that it was that Christian imp uh, emperor, Theodosius, who in 382 passed a law that made same-sex marriage illegal. That was when the first law went in. They think, oh, you know, it's always been illegal. No, sorry, you know, you don't make, it Ill you don't make something illegal if people didn't have it. Now, it may not have been widespread for, because the nature of marriage at that time was nothing like it is today. But it was still, you know, it was still there. Um, so, at the point of Hyatt, sometimes um, I guess he's an example of, uh, I wouldn't say conservative, but to justify certain pragmatic attitudes towards cultural norms to say, like, you know, these things have emerged from a like, spontaneous order process, like somehow there's some benefit for the society running this way or else. 
to have not have you know, persisted for so long. Uh, and so therefore, we should examine with skepticism any idea that we should change something just because it's old. You know, like, um, do you think that this is a reason to give a presumption in favor of a traditional norm just because it stood the test of time? Or do you think, I, th I think Hayek's being misquoted in a sense, because what Hayek actually said wasn't that we should be skeptical of change, but whether that we should be skeptical of imposing the change. Uh, Hayek talked about change that was, in a sense, bottom-up change, that was spontaneous change. Uh, I, th I use the gay marriage example because I think it's a perfect example of a Hayekian example of how the change took place here before it ever reached government. Government is the latecomer to that revolution. They are not the people who have been leading it. You've, you've seen corporations and businesses recognizing the relationships of, of uh, gay employees, recognizing their uh, partners, giving them health insurance. All of this stuff started happening decades ago. And what, is, what happened with the conservatives, as Hayek warned, using state power to, to try to prevent the change. And in fact, many of the anti-gay marriage laws that conservatives have passed actually forbid private businesses from recognizing the relationships of gay employees. They're not just wanting to prevent you know, the, the legal recognition of it, but they want to prevent a private company from giving health benefits or any of the things that they would give to the spouse of uh, any of their other employees. So it, I actually think that you, know, you have to look how, where did this change come from? And Hayek also made the point, is the change not only bottom up, but is it consistent with other deep values that the society holds? If it's, if it's also consistent with those values, things like equality of rights, individual liberty, things like that, then he would say the, the bottom-up change is, is good. So I think there's a Hayekian case for change. Yeah, um, earlier you were talking about uh, how the notion of, I think you were talking about how the notion of fate affects like entrepreneurialism and, and innovation, how it, it can stifle, that it can be a value that, that uh, inhibits a market society, but uh, I don't know if you've ever read Helmut Schuch's, the uh, Austrian sociologist, his book, Envy, Envy Theory of Social Behavior. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they talk about how uh, economic development and, and envy um, are interrelated and how he, he yes. I think, yes. I don't know if it's him or someone else, suggests that the idea of fate in some way has allowed societies to suppress excessive envy. So they don't, you know, they can't attribute so if someone does well, uh, you know, in a harvest or something, it's just the matter of good fortune as opposed to uh, an evil spirit or something condemning them. So it, it, they have less reason to, to uh, um, entertain the idea of envy in their society. What do you think? Uh, of well, I'm looking. I'm thinking now. Go to the areas where people do have those sort of strong religious beliefs that and that these things come from God. And then their, their next argument is, well, because it's God's blessing, it should be shared equally. I would argue it's on a continuum. I, yeah. I think it's a society that's totally uh, committed to the idea of faith is probably not that functional, but, but I think some degree of good fortune, I agree with the sure. <clears throat> Again, it also depends on whether we're talking about the entire culture or if we're talking about individuals. A lot of value, there, as I said, there's a lot of values that we can, we can endure in a society that individuals hold that are different and that are counterproductive. But once it becomes widespread, it's a problem. It's not a, it's not a problem to, the, to freedom when it's individually held, but when it's culturally held. Wait. Yeah, I don't know. Have you ever read the book by James Payne, The History of Force? You with that book? Uh, I read it some years ago, and, but I can't honestly say I remember much about it. Well, what I remember of it is that there's a certain, he goes back over a 2,000 year time frame, and he looks at the history of force, and he says there's a certain inevitability where we're, we're moving culturally, we're moving away from using force. Um, and so there's a certain inevitability toward libertarian or or volunteer activities. Uh, that, that was the essence of the book. I'm just 
right. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily inevitable, but I do think we're moving on that path. Okay. Now, whether, whether it remains inevitable, only the future can tell us. And one, one of his arguments that I remember is that so there's sort of an up and a down to it. So in other words, capital punishment, as an example, um, is becoming rarer and rarer. You know, I, I think our, we, our race, uh, human race, is still is learning and that it's been improving and that the values have been getting better. I don't think it's a steady course, but I do think it's been an upward course. Thank you.